whoever is in there, whoever attempts to go into it, is committing a criminal offence. And that's where the police are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so one response to the kind of growing housing crisis in Dublin and soaring rents and all of that sort of thing over the last year has been a, a kind of growing wave of people occupying abandoned buildings and bringing them back into usage. Um, Probably the one most people will have noticed was the Grange Gorman complex, which was probably occupied what about two years ago now. Yeah, uh, two years ago, yeah. Yeah, and I mean that was there was what about twenty people probably living there. It's a big complex with uh, um, several distinct dwellings in it. Um, in that case, it was a fairly typical story about property speculation. It was a huge parcel that had been assembled before the crash, ended up in Nama, and then uh, there was the uh, First of all, the kind of uh, violent eviction attempt, which involved... Illegal, too. Illegal, yeah. yeah. Which involved probably, what, 20 to 30 private security battering their way in at uh, and 6 o'clock Including guarding following them straight in behind, yeah. Yeah, and a dubious guard role at that. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about that to start with. So, uh, in that case, we, I mean, the whole purpose of that, ad that eviction now seems very clear was simply to uh, get the site rid of people living there so that it could be sold. Uh, you know, in fact, not so that it could be sold for any particular purpose, but so that it can be so, um, traded. I live up the road from it, so I cycle past fairly regularly, and it's still abandoned. I mean, the only difference is that they've put a load of security lighting in there. But, uh, in fact, one of the um, uh, the banners is still hanging from the window, I've noticed. Uh, and as also, as far as I'm aware, they're also paying private security to sit in the place and mind it 24-7, which is, I'd say, a huge expense as well. Yeah, so in any sort of rational world, that kind of really doesn't make any sense. You know, you're turfing a load of people out in the street, literally, so that you can pay other people to sit in the building doing nothing <laughs> to make sure nobody else actually tries to bring it back into use. Yeah, yeah I, I, was, I was talking to an individual who was cycling by that day who was talking to the private security guards, and they were saying, you know, thanks very much for occupying the site. You've given us so much work and all this stuff. And I think that actually is, like, an example of, like, the whole how messed up this system is that, that, it, that there's an incentive and also a need like them individuals who are sitting in their in their jobs do need people do need them empty buildings to sit in so they can feed their families and this stuff I don't have much sympathy with them don't get me wrong but like that, it, it kind of is a, a small example of how it warped up and wrong the whole capitalist status system is and what that's only like a, a microcosm of and a small example of that um, so immediately after Grange Gorman, uh, people moved out of Grange Gorman, they occupied uh, a row of houses that had also been empty for a considerable period of time just up the street, uh, which were owned by the HSE, and, and so got sort of got nicknamed the HSE houses. What happened there? Um, there was a public squad in action organised not long after, or I can't remember if it was before uh, Grange Gorman was emptied out, but I don't think it was, about 40 to 50 squatters in broad daylight with tools and ladders went up and um, liberated the homes for the, for the friends and themselves as a, an alternative accommodation to Green Scorn because they knew there was no way they were going to be able to hold it. Um, it transpired that the houses, the HSE, well obviously during that liberation, um, the HSE sent the Guardi down and the Guardi were obviously like, Guardi are intimidating and trying to coerce people into uh, leaving the houses and every line the book was told and every tactic was used during that there uh, but eventually private security did manage to get back into them homes and take them over and uh, again as far as I'm aware uh, them homes are still been uh, occupied by private security at the cost to the HSE. Yeah so um, uh, another case where people were thrown out and yeah. security yeah. were put in there to sit, th sit there doing nothing to stop more people getting in again. Um, so the next case I'm aware of was... The next one probably would have been Fibsborough Road eviction. Um, it was a small house on Fibsborough Road which had been vacant for years and it was been renovated by Unstrafe members which is an anti-capitalist housing group, direct action housing group, specifically focused on uh, squatting as a tactic uh, to put pressure on the government to uh, provide social housing and open up homes for uh, homeless people and homeless families and individuals. Uh, it's also part of the Irish Housing Network. But I, as far as I'm aware, the individuals in the home were in it for four or five days, uh, get, getting it ready um, and preparing it and fixing it up. And again, uh, as the videos online, as anyone seen the videos online, 
can tell it was an extremely violent eviction. The guards, there was about 12, 15 guards, six guard of cars, um, came off in the middle of the day, about three o'clock in the middle of the day. Uh, it took about 10 minutes to batter down the door and evicted everyone from the home. Again, as far as I'm aware, completely illegally. Uh, and left everyone in that house homeless. And as again, I'm told that the barricade then provided accommodation for them individuals. And after that? After that, it probably would have been the Bolt Hostel, oh, yeah. uh, which was uh, a project by the Irish Housing Network uh, with Unsprake, the anti capitalist housing group, taking the lead in it. Um, they liberated the building and began immediate renovations on it. It wasn't, as far as I'm aware, in, uh, like, I'm pretty sure it was in a, a very livable state, but they wanted it absolutely up to spec uh, because uh, homeless individuals, families and that there, you know, they've come through a lot of trauma and they need it somewhere comfortable and safe to be um, to be housed in and they, they need an environment where they, they can they can relax after all the stress they've been through. So they put a lot of work into fixing it up, uh, put fire doors in it, painting it, decorating it, putting uh, bed clothes and everything in it and uh, fitting the kitchen out and again they housed several individuals, homeless individuals in the in that building which was a county council building which was up for, and still is up for uh, development into um, basically flats for rich people, there's no other way of putting it, like the apartments for rich people, they, they had left it idle for years and again from talking to people who were in the building, the, it would, within three weeks they were able to make it safe and habitable for uh, families, individuals and children. Um, and again the council just, and in negotiations with the council they were they, they, they clearly did not care about the issue themselves, they cared only about any embarrassment that may cause it and at the end of it they threatened two activists who were named on the injunction with 100,000 uh, charges that if they did not vacate the building immediately they would be faced at in the High Court. Uh, which 100,000 euro. 100,000 euro, yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, these individuals, one of them was a teacher in DCU but um, and another one was a single mother with three children I think. There was no way they were able to fight that in court. There was no way they were able to stand up to them, them threats. And again, the building had to be vacated because of the, the actions of the state. Well, the courts played a particularly cynical role uh, with, at the end of the boats. If I remember correctly, um, they, the, the judge didn't give an injunction against uh, forcing people to move out. But he did grant one that said they couldn't do any further work on the place and they had to allow a council inspection. And right. then, of course, the council inspection found work that needed to be done, so yeah. people had to move out. Yeah, that's right. Like, it was kind of like Green's Warm and uh, the injunction came there. It's just a tactic to stall and uh, an attempt to demoralise and destroy the people involved. Uh, they said, the, the judge ordered that no more work was to be done in the building, as you said, but like, there wasn't some necessary work like fitting a fire door at the back. To make it like up to government spec, uh, but uh, again, as I uh, the inspectors who came in, they weren't just rude, uh, they weren't just impatient, but they were just unreasonable in general. They said a couch in the living room was a fire hazard, and that was one of the reasons why they struck off the building as being unsafe. You know that is the sort of you know this, what they were willing to stoop to. And they just uh, as as individuals, they did not care. They were not interested in. Uh, the building been used to hold, house people who were in desperate situations. So after the bolt, we could, um, which would be next, would it be the. And uh, next after the bolt, probably would be Dreamhouse. I think. Right, Dreamhouse possibly. Uh, uh, is Dreamhouse was named Dreamhouse because it was such a wonderful house, uh, with high ceilings, big clean rooms, and um, it was down near Conley Station, I think. And uh, the owner of the house, um, first of all, sent uh, local thugs to beat the two local thugs to uh, break down the door, and everyone in the house who was there to defend the house felt like their safety was um, a threat from that there because they came with a sledgehammer in the middle of the day to batter down the door. As you'd expect, you'd be a little afraid, like, uh, and they were basically like the door held up and they, they left after a while. But uh, an injunction came into place, and which stipulated, as far as I'm aware, jail time for anyone caught in the house. And again, the people in that home um, did not feel comfortable. They, they did not see the point in sticking in the building and going to jail out of principle. 
when we had the barricade in to store their stuff and where they could stay for a while till we found them a new home. Um, yeah. Next one was uh, Avocado. Avocado Bastard, yeah. Um, that was, uh, I seen it myself when people first came into it. The place was a pretty bad state, but uh, this, the squatters involved spent a month doing it up, fixing roofs and making it habitable. And it was pretty, like a kitchen, living room, everything, like everything all the basics you needed to live in. Uh, there was an eviction attempt, I believe, at about nine or ten o'clock at night, um, and um, the guardie turned up, including um, a, a special branch officer, I think, with the battering ram and about six to seven guard cars and maybe fifteen guards altogether. Uh, people outside the house, about fifteen people were called up to, to support part people part of the community, and we all formed a, a chain outside the house. And that stopped the guards for the time uh, getting through the door and they backed off. But as we were leaving, they had also actually called the riot uh, cops to come up, the riot squad to come up. But they came up too late after the initial guards had decided to leave. But we, we a van of them, about eight of them, came up the road in full riot gear, ready to basically attack and beat everyone out of the way to get in the house. Again, there was no injunction on this house. The house had been left empty for years and it wasn't a wreck. It was not being used. Um, but they were more than willing to inflict violence and those trying to defend someone's home for, well, I don't know what's going through their heads, but following orders, I assume. The next day, um, two individuals in the house were securing barricades in the anticipation of another eviction, and an eviction attempt, and guards immediately turned up, battered in the bottom panel of the door, came in, pepper sprayed, and generally were, were extremely uh, rough with the individuals in the house and uh, took them out and it was too late. By the time people got off there to support the house, the individuals in the house had been arrested and taken away. Again, there have been no charges from that there because it is a civil matter. There is, this is not a criminal matter. This is not the domain of the guardian to be involved in until an injunction comes into place and makes it criminal. Um, so, yeah, I mean, with, with some of the evictions we've talked about where there didn't seem to be any legal process at all, but the cops were very involved. It makes you wonder if the uh, the owners of the building might have been retired guards or whatever themselves. But this area in Dublin in particular, it's infamous, infamous because a lot of the worst of the uh, slum accommodation mm -hmm. is the landlords or cops. Yeah. And if yeah. you know if they've any problems with you, then the the cops come around and sort sort it out for them. Uh, yeah, just guesswork. I mean, just me being cynical on that. But. No, no, like, like that. Very suspicious out there. Like, and also like they're all like macho lads, all fired up, and you know. And they have no idea, and clearly they have no idea that like the trauma they're inflicting upon people. But I, I have strong suspicious suspicions in many of these evictions. Either that uh, retired guards, guards putting pressure on them that they do want houses occupied in this area because they may be their homes that are you know the houses that they are renting out to uh, people that may eventually be occupied. So they want to kind of nip this in the bud. It's it's their own self interest. Like you know, it's the it's the money before people and all that stuff again. And then after Avocado, the next eviction is probably, is that the Firehouse? Yeah, that would have been Firehouse, which was up in Gardner Place, I Gardner think. Gardner Place, yeah. Gardner Place, yeah. And, and it was, uh, I think the building was owned by, uh, it is, like, it's a spurious kind of like legal situation, but uh, I'm pretty sure it was like some um, development company or like a uh, big development company owned it. And an injunction happened in place on the building, uh, for previous residents in, in the building when I don't know what went down but they stayed in the building occupied it and didn't ref refuse to pay rent so that injunction was still in place then the injunction was extended to, extended to the current occupiers of the house and uh, individuals decided to remain in the house and resist eviction but um, from what I'm told the Gardaí and the riot squad turned up and uh, with a heavy presence um, with the turtle formation at the door with two guards working at the door with battering rams and crowbars and they got in the house within half an hour the whole street there have been guards by the way at either end of the street um, you know blocking traffic and stopping people coming and they got in and chased people up the street stairs onto the roof and eventually they negotiated the people to come off the roof and they brought them straight to the high court which they had prepared for them Again, uh, these people are now all homeless and they have nowhere to go uh, by the barricade. So I, I think one pattern we've seen probably caused those evictions is the Garda are becoming a lot more um, 
well, they're turning into bigger numbers and yeah. they're kind of more yeah. violent as well. And that whole tortoiseshell formation of people know uh, Asterix, the gold comics, that's the, you know, yeah, the this Roman is Shield. Ro- this is Roman kind of war <laughs> stuff. Like, I, I don't know what's going through their heads, like, but um, these, most people they're dealing with here are like, but I don't um, like, they're, they're clearly escalating their tactics and the pressure is coming from them above, especially I've noticed in the media, like uh, the Socialist Party and, and Ruth Gomsher that have book up, uh, they've launched a few actions to um, occupy some homes in North Dublin that they're, don't get me wrong, cynical about that and the propaganda they're trying to get from that. But like I think what they're trying to do is nip this in the bud before we actually build a proper movement that can house people and put pressure on the government to force them into building social housing and opening up houses for people. Uh, they're, they're clearly escalating. Yeah, because I mean, the, the, I mean, we've seen in inner city Dublin there are loads of empty places. Yeah. Um, but actually, once you get out into the suburbs, uh, there's also quite a lot of places that were built and are lying vacant and you know, the right beside communities where people are family members who are homeless or you know, sleeping on couches mm. or whatever else. Um, and there's probably got to be a bit of fear among the kind of property developers and landlord class that people would do the logical thing. And, yeah. you know, you'd actually get quite large uh, communities out in some of the suburbs who would go, OK, we're taking over that block of 20 houses and we're yeah. moving in the people from this community that can't get a housing any other way. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. Like, and like, in fairness, this should be afraid because this is not a hard thing to do. Like, it is not hard to liberate a building, occupy it and build some barricades and defend it, especially if you have some community support and you build up trust and uh, an affinity with people around you. And if you come from a working class estate, you already have that with people. There has been actions again around North Dublin, like um, families have been put in into local communities and that there, and they've been very successful and the local communities have supported them. One of the actions I forgot to mention was, uh, I believe in Coolock, um, uh, housing act, squatter housing activists um, had opened up a house for a woman and her three children and the guardie turned up the next morning uh, she was supposed to come the next morning but the guardie came before again with shields out uh, um, crowbar had opened the door they're extremely obviously like guards do they're rude and they're loud and everything broke every rule in the book as they were doing the arrests and these the two individuals the housing activists involved are now facing charges Again, like the, the, the nothing will come to them charges. Them charges are only to burn them out, an attempt to burn them out and stop what they're doing. Like, if if communities had you know the the confidence and the inspiration to do this, this it isn't actually a hard tactic to employ. Like it's um it's, it's quite simple to open up a building and fix it up if you have a few friends and that there are a few people having the will willing to help out and like th- those people will come out of the woodwork when it's uh, there's families and that and homeless individuals involved I've seen that happen and it will happen again if we organise it properly Okay well that sort of gives an impression I think of, of the volume of stuff that's been going on with the very, I mean, we're in the barricade in at the moment and all this has happened within about half a kilometre mm. of the barricade in over, over the last three or four months um, and there's far more buildings in this area actually empty. I mean, you can walk around the streets and look up, and you notice yeah. how, how much empty, how many empty buildings there are. Uh, pattern we're seeing right across the island. So, in, in terms of the occupations we've seen, um, that they also haven't come from nowhere. I mean, most of them have been visible in the last year, although some of them were older than that, but just people were being quiet. Uh, where would you see this whole kind of movements coming out of, like the, the sort of idea of, of putting space into use? Well, it's it, a lot of this inspiration actually comes from the English squat movement, the European on the continent, the squat movement, and a lot of people who originally started this off were inspired by that. Also, on an ideological level, um, most of the people involved at the start were anarchist socialists or somehow anti capitalists, so it's natural for them to want to put their politics into practice, which is like if a building is empty and it's not in use, then uh, those who are homeless have a right to use it. Um, the market in itself. Uh, came from well like it didn't entirely originate from but was inspired by those involved in the Shomer's Free Collective uh, which was a rented social centre I think it was open for over 10 years in maybe three different locations mm. and it provided space for again gigs fundraising office space meeting space and all that uh, and it came to the point where rent just could not be paid and it was either closed down altogether or squat a uh, social centre um, myself I was studying in college at the time I was studying law and I heard some friends wanted to squat a social centre and I thought like I hadn't wanted to do it for a long time so I 
deferred college or quick college, basically quick college and uh, went to help out in the social centre and that's where I came from involved in this. Um, again it comes from a very political and also humanitarian aspect like uh, within within the people involved like they want to put their politics into practice but the, in, the, in the long scheme of things or in the medium term things it is the aim of it is to house homeless people and homeless families and out there and build some sort of movement that will put pressure on the state to force them to do it because they won't do it without pressure put on them. Like.